Hey everyone, how's it going? So, uh, everyone hear me all right? You good? All right. Uh, how many people here have heard of uh, Marlin firmware? All right. That's about everybody. How, how many people of you? Uh, how many of you have ever installed or upgraded your printer? Right on. Wow. Okay. So most of you. That's great. Uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Scott Latine. I uh, I'm the maintainer or custodian, janitor of Marlin firmware. And uh, basically, right now uh, we're in a big transitional stage, moving on to 32-bit uh, boards, expanding uh, our features, and just basically trying to keep up with the state of the art sort of stuff you'd ex hope or expect to be in your firmware. Uh, obviously, a lot of new features are coming online. People expect, you know, filament runout detection and power loss recovery and stuff like that. So a lot of that's going on. But uh, let's try this button. Hey, all right. So uh, my background is in software. I started out doing, uh, you know, like a lot of people, just playing around with Atari computers and learning to code. and. Did some game coding in the in the 80s and 90s. Uh, written some music software for fun on the Mac, and uh, for a while did web development, uh, and uh, wrote some Mac apps, and got into mobile. Basically, been playing with all this kind of stuff for a long time, uh, but I got really tired of being on the desktop. It's probably why I went to mobile in the first place and touch. Sort of uh, started to get away from that uh, paradigm of you know sitting in front of a, a screen and doing everything with a mouse and keyboard. Uh, and so uh, I started playing with that, and creative coding sort of called to me a little bit. And in the process of uh, exploring creative coding, I discovered there's this thing called Arduino, and you could do all kinds of things, art installations or whatever, with, uh, with these little embedded coding processors. And uh, so that sort of uh, drew me in. And when I was looking for projects to, to do something with an Arduino, uh, as I was looking around, I discovered that they were the, the heart of a lot of these devices called 3D printers. And there'd been this RepRap thing, and that had popped up. And uh, so I, I immediately started playing with that. I thought that would be a good first project. You know, get a printer first, and then, then you can make the stuff that you need to make your stuff. And so that would be a great start, rather than doing something like a, an LED cube or something like that, which can be good, but, you know, it's just uh, it's good soldering practice is basically all you get out of that. Um, so uh, let's move on. Uh, hey, so there they are. Uh, yeah, exactly. Coding in electronics means I can get away from the desktop. And uh, you know, we didn't have these things uh, when I was in high school. Uh, or I might have gotten into electronics a lot sooner. Uh, at that time, I actually had an electronics class. And I, I dropped it because I was like, I'll take a free period. I'm already doing code, and I don't quite get this. And at that time, uh, Electronics was all about like radio, making radios, and maybe you could build a Heathkit computer, and uh, things like that. So it wasn't quite as interesting or exciting to me as someone who was doing software already. It was like, oh, I can make a few logic gates, but if I was ever going to build something as complex as the programs I'm already writing, you know, I, that would take me forever. And I would rather just sit down, write the code, have it happen, than s try and get into gates and things. But later on, these things came along, and uh, it became quite clear that there's a whole other level. You could, you could write your code in C++, now in Python or other languages, and just send signals. And it became much clearer that, hey, it's all about signals and input and output. Oh, right, of course. So you know what I was already doing on the computer, I could now expand into the real world. Um, so of course, the first thing I did was I got myself a Prusa and started, I built that and uh, started playing around with, you know, I got very excited with the first time I could design something and open SCAD and print it and have it in my hand. That kind of blew my mind. So, you know, I've been fixing my blenders and making business cards and doing whatever else because, you know, it's what you do. You just, the sky's the limit, so let's try all the things. Uh, of course, uh, I should mention that this is the 10th anniversary of RepRap uh, and the first Darwin and the child Darwin. There's Adrian and Nick Oliver, uh, of course, St. Adrian, St. Nick, uh, with their first two. And uh, that's what it began at all. Um, you know, there you are, parent and child. Uh, of course, the next one, you're, it, it spawned a whole generation. You got your, your Mendel by uh, Ed Sells. And you got your Mendel uh, 
I2 by Joe Prusha. Uh, and then Delta started showing up. Uh, there's, of course, uh, the Ro uh, Johan Rokal's uh, Rostock. And, uh, and then, of course, the Prusha I3 came along. And as I was hunting around for 3D printers, it was like you could buy one all pre-made uh, in a cube shape or whatever. But this was the one that got me excited. I just liked the elegance. I thought it was uh, great to have this elegant design and not a lot of uh, threaded rods and things. And so it was really kind of cool to see something that was developing and getting more elegant and more. And of course, you know, this one has spawned more probably clones than any other machine. And uh, there were, of course, the 10th anniversary celebration at E3D, the green cake, and a, a few random makers who you might know. Uh, and now, of course, uh, 3D printing has really grown and it's fallen into the mainstream. We, uh, we see shows like Black Mirror and Westworld, Altered Carbon, and Lost in Space, all featuring 3D printing uh, in various ways. And I think the most realistic one probably being Lost in Space. Uh, it took a couple hours to print that uh, uh, cast there in, on, a, on their 3D printer with support material and everything. I really want that one. Uh, I don't think we'll get the uh, being able to make a clone of yourself just yet, but maybe later. Uh, so I, I often make a, an analogy to the, uh, the Homebrew Computer Club, and that this movement is a lot like the Homebrew Computer Club. Back in those days, uh, people were uh, building uh, Altair computers, and the ability to make one of those at home was like a big deal, and, and people were getting excited about what you might be able to do actually building a computer yourself. Um, and so, you know, we had gatherings look, that look a lot like this. And uh, a, a lot of us look like these folks. And, you know, this, of course, spawned Bill Gates and Steve Wozniak and people like uh, uh, Steve Jobs and stuff. All came out of this, uh, this hobbyist movement, and there became that whole split between people who were into open source and others who were trying to defend the profit motive and capitalism and all that. And uh, so, you know, you've got your Apple One came out, and there, of course, uh, you know, there's a beautiful Apple computer that's just the kind of thing you might build back in those days. Uh, of course, our movement is much more advanced. Or is it? Uh, <laughs> you can build one of these right now. Uh, a rep wrap made of wood. Looks kind of like the Apple One. I don't know if those meters actually do anything, but they probably do. Uh, but if you really want to find out more, of course, you can learn about it through the media. Maybe, uh, maybe you'd want to wait, though. There's a, there's a rep rap documentary being made by Thompson Lauderer and Richard Horn and some others. So uh, I'd say wait for that before you get the real full history of what's been going on in rep rap. I don't think it's really been, uh, I don't think the story's really been told yet, so I hope it will be soon. Uh, so anyway, Marlin. What is Marlin? Why do, why do we use it? What's the big deal? Uh, there's a lot of possible software you could use. Um, of course, we are, our stack is you're going from 3D modeling to STL plugin uh, to export your models. You're slicing them. You've got some host software. And then uh, Marlin sits at the, at the end of the chain is the last piece of software that's processing your G-code to produce the, the final result on your 3D printer. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of firmwares out there, actually. Uh, and some of them are still going. Uh, Sprinter was the basis for Marlin. It was a combination of that and uh, Gerbil, which is uh, basically for uh, CNC. And so a lot of the, those kind of came together and became Marlin. But Repetier firmware is still out there. Uh, Sailfish, uh, I guess naming firmware after Sailfish and Marlins is a thing. Uh, RepRap firmware is actually uh, getting some new steam and getting new, new versions. Uh, there's now something called Clipper, which, is, uh, which takes more of the load and puts it onto a Raspberry Pi and then produces code that's a little more efficient so that the, the embedded Arduino or whatever it might be on your printer doesn't have to work as hard. And it can do some fancier things as a result. Uh, but we're trying to get some of that into Marlin as well. Um, of course, Marlin is for your, originally for your 8-bit AVR processors, which are processors eventually uh, invented around 1998 by a couple of college students. Um, and uh, I think uh, AVR is basically just the, their initials, I think is where the, it doesn't really stand for anything, but 
you could say it's their initials, uh, but originally by uh, Eric van der Zalm and Camille Goebbels uh, in Holland, and uh, Eric now works for Ultimaker. But originally was kind of targeted at Ultimaker, and so if you look at Marlin 1.0, your default config is for Ultimaker. Uh, it is free open source software. It's hosted on GitHub. Has been on GitHub for pretty much the whole time. Uh, and it was originally conceived in yeah, 2011. Uh, and as far as Arduino sketches go, uh, it's huge. Uh, you know, typically your Arduino is going to have a 5K program on it that does something. But this thing is uh, pretty much, if you enable all the features, you can pretty much eat up all the space even on a Mega 2560, which has 256K. Uh, at, the, at the moment, it supports more than 50 different boards uh, with different configurations and pin settings and so forth. Uh, over 20 languages, probably 25 by now. Uh, it supports different kinematics, so you can have a DeltaBot, a SCARA, uh, HBOT. Uh, it's a very lightweight program. You com it, it's set up so that it compiles only the code that you would actually use as opposed to something like SmoothieWare, which has a little more room to play with and a faster processor, uh, where it actually, you can configure basically, it has everything in it, and then you just turn stuff on and off. With Marlin, you just turn on the things you need, and that's what ends up in the code, and so it ends up being more lightweight and runs better on your AVRs. Uh, it's very configurable, many features. Uh, uh, this wouldn't be a complete talk without talking a little bit about the GPL and maybe some of what's been going on with the GPL. Uh, Marlin is an open source, uh, and it's under the general public license, which uh, is a very popular license because it imbues software uh, with rights to the, to the end user so that you can basically continue to modify it yourself. And the idea behind Marlin is that we guarantee that when you get Marlin, you're going to get the source code, and we hope that vendors will abide by that. Uh, sometimes they don't, and that's been annoying us lately. But uh, yeah, essentially, the rights that you're given are you can modify it all you want. You can install it on any device that you want. Uh, it's, uh, if you want to use Marlin in your commercial product, that's fine. Uh, originally, the README at Marlin would say, no, we'd rather you didn't. But uh, we've warmed up to it. Uh, there's a lot of clones out there, and we want to support those as much as possible. Uh, if, you're not, if you're only using it in your own project, of course, you don't have to give away the source code. Uh, that's not a stipulation of the GPL that if you modify something, you have to give it away to everyone. Actually, you only have to give it to your customers. Uh, so essentially, the obligations that we hope people will follow are that they'll uh, provide it to their customers uh, and include the, a copy of the license so the customers are aware that they have rights. And if you uh, ship them, basically, if you give away the binary at all, uh, and this is another deal here, is if you're contracted to modify it for any client, uh, you've got to give your client the source code too. And this became a bit of a, a source of contention for Creality 3D. Uh, I guess they're, uh, according to them, the, uh, the contractor didn't give them the source. They, uh, so they had to slap them with a, a wet fish. And eventually, they did give them the source. So we now have uh, access to that. We can see what they did right and not so good. Uh, but it's great. We have it now so we can make those improvements and, and share it with the rest of the world. Uh, as far as getting people to comply, well, basically, it's hard, especially across international borders. Uh, this is a, you know, it's protected by copyright, and copyright law is uh, pretty straightforward. You've got DMCA and so forth. But essentially, uh, we hope that there'll be good trade agreements because uh, it's hard to enforce this stuff across international borders if there aren't good guidelines for copyrights and patents and things. Uh, but in practice, we find that generally it's just good to have dialogue and make sure that people understand the GPL and its benefits. If you're a vendor, uh, you can save yourself years and of effort and lots of money uh, by using something like Marlin, which is already there, configuring it, setting it up for your machine. Uh, and then basically, uh, we just ask that you know if you're going to use it, please share your uh, share your source with, the, with your customers because uh, they're entitled to it. Uh, there's a free software foundation and they'll sometimes step in to help with legal uh, intervention, but basically they recommend, uh, as I said, the, uh, just use, uh, keep a dialogue open and make sure people understand the license. 
but we now have a site called gplfenders.com, uh, started by Tim Hoagland of TH3D and myself, uh, basically to uh, just collect information about who's complying and who's not, and sort of uh, give uh, praise and kudos to those who are complying, and uh, you know, uh, wag our fingers a little bit at those who need to catch up. We think it'll be good for uh, the, basically the culture around 3D printers uh, with vendors everywhere in China, wherever, uh, to just basically, you know, when you get together with other vendors, uh, you know, uh, talk about the GPL and, and, and uh, you know, its benefits and let them know that, you know, the, to be a good community player, it's good to abide by licenses and so forth. Because uh, it's good for your reputation. It's an honorable thing to do. Uh, our liaison in China is Naomi Wu. She's been very helpful in facilitating communication with, uh, with vendors there, especially Creality. Uh, so my work in maintaining, Mar uh, maintaining Marlin from day to day uh, involves, uh, you know, I'll just go in every day and check, the, check, see what's going on, look for new contributions. Uh, I clean up and integrate submissions. I read and respond to bug reports. Uh, I'll do what I can to fix bugs and implement stuff if I know how to implement it. Uh, and I'll write documentation and try to help the developers understand what they need to do to make the code good. Um, I use uh, various tools, GitHub, Desktop, and a little bashing, use some uh, scripts to help myself speed the process along. Uh, but basically, you know, having the data sheets and stuff, being able to find these uh, pieces of information online is super helpful. Uh, there's a lot of smart people. Like I know most of Marlin pretty well, but in a very cursory way, some of it. And there are people who know it really deeply and understand things like ARM processors in ways that I don't yet, so it's important to have those resources. And uh, you know, I get donated hardware helps a lot uh, so that I can play around with new screens and other devices and get them integrated. And uh, you know, I can always use funds for coffee, that helps. Uh, so uh, yeah, working at GitHub is great. Uh, it's a, a really cool environment for collaboration. Uh, and uh, all you need to do is, if you want to you know, submit ideas or request features or report bugs, is just get an account there. It's free. Uh, and then send us info about you know, what's going on. Send us, show us your videos and pictures and tell us all about your problems. And we'll do what we can to fix them up and uh, adapt things to your needs. Um, our guiding principles are basically we want to keep it lightweight and keep it working even on the older, smaller boards where they don't have, you know, gobs of memory and all that stuff. Um, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, everything is slim and uh, we want to make sure that it works well with host software. Uh, we don't want to be too clever in the firmware because it should run pretty lean and it should be a good, you know, it should basically obey your commands and do what you expect. So we don't want to be too smart, but sometimes we do it bend the rules. We'll have things like uh, linear advance extrusion, where it tries to basically do the extrusion based on pressure and uh, anticipate how much ooze there might be and prevent that. We'll adjust the flow based on the filament width sensor. Uh, you know, we do PID for your heaters, of course. Uh, things like firmware-based retraction, so you can adjust that and not have the slicer know it. Um, some, some of these things are just good to have while it's running. Uh, we find, and of course, kinematics uh, also step in and do some things. We'll tweak, especially with SCARA, um, we'll do things like tweak the feed rate. You give it the feed rate in millimeters per second, and we convert it to degrees per second and make sure that the extruder and all that line up with the motion of the, of the planner and stuff, uh, and your steppers are all going and basically well together. Um, there are some good forks of Marlin out there that um, we're starting to integrate them more into the main fork, but there was some really good work by uh, um, a guy who calls himself Mago Kimbra and worse not Naze. And these were like, you know, some of the earliest work for 32-bit uh, boards. That, and so we've been uh, taking a lot of cues from them. And May, uh, Marlin Kimbra might have ended up as the, as the basis for Marlin 2.0, but uh, we, we had so much going on that wasn't already there. We thought it would be better to just take the best and use, use it as guidance and just follow his amazing example and just try and continue to improve uh, and make it better that way. So what does it do at the low level? And uh, you probably know this pretty well. 
but I'll give you a basic, uh, in a general print session, you want to be able to home, find out where the print head is, get your bed probed if it's not perfectly flat and make sure you get a nice first layer. Uh, and so and you'll, you'll have it wait for the heaters to heat up and then you'll go in, print all your stuff. You might pause the print or lose power for some reason and you want to be able to recover. Uh, we want to be able to handle errors. Uh, and then at the end, if we finish, move the nozzle out of the way, throw your print at you and maybe if it's got a belt on it nowadays, it'll, we'll roll it off the belt and start another one. Uh, so a lot of cool things going on that we need to be able to do at the basic level. Um, so to do that, we have a G-code interpreter. We basically, we process basic rep-wrap G-code. Very simple stuff. Uh, same stuff that's been used in CNC for a long time. We do it a little differently. Uh, you can't have multiple G-codes on the same line, for example, like you can in CNC. But we're starting to uh, adapt to CNC methodologies. So you, some of that may come along. Uh, all that gets turned into stuff for the planner that anticipates how to accelerate and decelerate. Uh, there's a stepper routine that takes care of moving the steppers and getting everything going along with controlling the temperature, handling your LCD and your interface, reading your SD card, and maybe even writing stuff to the SD card, uh, and taking care of all the sensors and extra add-ons. So there's a lot going on in there, and that's why it is such a big, complex sketch. Um, and here's a little diagram that you can memorize. Um, it just basically shows what I described. There's uh, all the things that happen to make it actually work and uh, how we chew through all those uh, little blocks of, to keep things moving along smoothly. Um, in configuration, we decided uh, early on uh, to use basically C++ defines, which allow us to decide what code to keep, what to throw out, and basically make the code as small and compact as possible. Uh, and that has some advantages over, for example, like letting the compiler figure it out later. It compiles a bit faster, and you can do things like uh, go looking for some feature name and find all the blocks that have it and rip them out, and then you don't have to look at that code anymore. Uh, so you can produce a pretty small, very compact bit of Marlin for just your purposes. And I've done like uh, making a tiny piece of Marlin that just did a Z axis with four motors and some end stops. And that was really easy to do because of this uh, configuration methodology. Um, so here's some example common configuration options you all know. Your motherboard, your axis for steps per unit, how many extruders, your, what's your LCD or do you want SD support. Um, thermal protection, of course, we Hope that that'll be turned on when you ship your product. Um, and, uh, you know, we're adding things all the time. So we have filament runout sensors, a filament width sensor. All these things, add ons can be turned on at will. And down at the bottom, we're adding some new cool things like real junction deviation, which is a way of uh, dealing with cornering. Uh, we have S curve acceleration so that as you're printing, you won't spill the drink that you've set on your bed. Uh, it'll just slosh but not spill. Uh, but basically the purpose of that is to keep your printer from shaking your table and it makes, uh, it reduces ringing and things like that which are artifacts that you see as you change speed. Uh, and so uh, of course you probably know how to install Marlin if you've done it. Uh, you get your Arduino, you open the INO, you click upload. We're uh, focusing a lot more on platform I.O. because of the 32-bit stuff. Uh, and that actually can speed things up a bit. Uh, it does a, it's got some speedier uh, functions. And uh, we're, of course, requiring that to do Marlin 2.0 on 32-bit boards. But we still support Arduino IDE uh, for the AVR boards. So the future of Marlin is looking pretty good. Um, we've been adding a lot of good stuff. We've been improving support for trinamic drivers. Uh, which do uh, much quieter and uh, smoother stepping. Um, we've added power loss recovery, which we, uh, Creality 3D was kind enough to provide for us and have been adapting that. Um, that is based on SD cards, so it's basically on every layer it writes to the SD card at least once. Um, and if you lose power, it just looks for that file when you start it back up and tries to restart. So there's some advantage to just doing it once per layer like that. You know, everybody has SD cards, so it's 
You don't need any special hardware. The disadvantage is that if it goes to restart, it's going to start from the beginning of the layer again. So you, may, you might have some issues with that. And of course, if you don't get it soon enough, your, your print might pop off of your cold bed. So it doesn't always work, but it's, uh, it's better than not having it at all. Um, we are gonna, we've got a lot more configurations for popular printers, especially a lot of new Chinese clones. Um, and as I mentioned, junction deviation and S-curve acceleration are coming in, even on AVR, which is great. We have a, a guy in Argentina who's really good with assembly language and making stuff fast. And uh, um, I want him to marry me. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, and of course, uh, now we're adding an auto build option for platform IO. So you just set your motherboard, and it figures out how to, what to build for you. Uh, and you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to figure out what your processor is or any of that. Um, Marlin 2.0 uh, finally adds 32-bit support for things like your, uh, your DO, your STM, your LPC, all, all of the you know, smoothie board and all the boards that are basically out there and more besides. Um, it has improved language engines, so you'll have a bit smaller build, uh, even on AVR, um, with, especially with graphical LCD. It's like you really want to have as much uh, free space as possible. Uh, we've added hang printer support is coming, uh, with, thanks to the help of uh, Torsten. Uh, backlash compensation uh, is, has been added uh, by our, our friends at uh, Lulzbot. Um, it has a reorganized LCD menu, also from Lulzbot. Uh, and we're adding support for more smart panels, which are basically panels that uh, are usually touch screens that send G-code uh, to the printer, rather than your you know, stupid panels where we're writing to them all the time, and basically they're, they have a button or a wheel or whatever. Um, and uh, are we going to add support for a real-time OS? real-time operating system, which is a way that a lot of embedded software is done. Uh, quite possibly, uh, we're looking into that, and we have a branch that does that. So that could be exciting. Uh, we uh, have a documentation project, so we're always looking for people to help us with that. Uh, I'm trying to make more videos about Marlin myself and uh, write up as much as I can on the website, the marlinfw.org website. Um, if you want to contribute or help out with that, here's our URL. Um, and if you want to get more information about Marlin, the home page is Marlin firmware slash Marlin on GitHub. That's where all the code is, where you uh, send your issues and make your feature requests. MarlinFW.org is the website where we're posting documentation and trying to make it as good as possible. And uh, you can find me at patreon.com slash thinkyhead where I'm uh, posting stuff all the time and uh, begging for your help so that I can continue working on it in my copious spare time. Uh, and uh, that's the end of the slides, so thank you very much uh, for hanging out and getting the lowdown.